Welcome to your program, Power and Counsel, with Pastor Sammy. Have you ever wondered about someone that is probably more than meets the eye, as uh, the word says or phrase says? I would like to uh, introduce to you a person who we are blessed that we, he is still with us here in this lifetime. He is a character in his own defining. His name is J.J. Arms, and we would like to... Uh, do a tribute in his honor on his life, but we would also like to get more of a personal perspective about him and his faith in Christ and his accomplishments in life and his family as well. To be able to do so, uh, I would like to introduce to you his son, J.J. Arms III, who now joins us uh, here in our program today. And I would like to remind everybody, if you uh, have any relatives that would probably know who uh, JJ Arms is, I want you to share this information with them and share this program with them as well. If it happens to be that you have relatives that don't speak English, please remember that all our programs are also available in Spanish under the program Poder y Consejo con Pastor Sammy. And we are on Spotify, Rumble, and YouTube as well. We ask you, we need to count on you for you to make an account, it's free to do so, and click on the subscribe button and the follow button uh, or the notification bell, whichever one comes out uh, in those three formats. We're also, again, in all those three formats in Spanish. We have one shout out to do on one recent subscriber who is very dear to our heart. His name is Pastor Lorenzo Aguirre from a Word of Life Church in Espanol. So Pastor Lorenzo, thank you so much for joining us here and thank you for following us as well. And now, without any further ado, I would like to give the introduction to a great man uh, who is also doing some great phenomenal work in the area of Dallas, Texas. And he is also from our local town, El Paso, Texas. Uh, Mr. J.J. Arms III, please say hi uh, and hello to the audience. Good afternoon. And uh, Mr. J.J. Arms, uh, what if you would be so kind to share uh, with the audience what work you are currently doing and where people can reach you for those services as well. I am an international private investigator. I've been an international private investigator for 36 years. Um, I worked with my father in El Paso, Texas at our family owned firm, The Investigator, uh, The Investigators for 33 years. Um, I started out there at uh, the age of 18. I was one of the youngest licensed investigators in the country. I literally got licensed within a few weeks after I turned 18. Worked with my dad since I was a little boy, uh, going on surveillance with him when I was five years old. I did my first big international case with him in Greece when I was 12 years old. And uh, I've been doing it ever since. And uh, I've since left El Paso to start my own firm. Uh, my, my firm is called Arms International Investigative Services, LLC, based in Dallas, Texas. Uh, if you'd like to know anything about my business, our website is www.arms-international.com. And how interesting that it's international and that you, and you were working with your dad in Greece, you said? That was your first case? Yeah, that was my first uh, international case where I was kind of my first big case. I had worked on, you know, side by side with my father. Um, you know, I'd, I'd always been fascinated with my dad's work and, um, he always, he says he tried to discourage me from becoming, uh, an investigator. He always wanted me to go into the medical field like most parents do. Mm. That is what their, their children be a doctor or lawyer if possible. Um, and my dad wanted me to be a doctor because mm. that was always his dream growing up was to be a doctor mm. before he lost his hands. Mm. Um, but I think in hindsight, he, it was kind of a half-hearted effort because, you know, every dad has that secret desire for their, their son or daughter to kind of follow their footsteps if they're successful at any specific thing. And, and um, I think that's kind of where my dad's true heart was. And, um, you know, I've, I've worked with him since I was a little boy. Uh, but my first big international case, it was an uh, international kidnapping case, was when I was 12. Wow. Wow. And so what was running through your mind uh, at that such young age, but yet working on such a important situation? I'm talking about, you said kidnapping, correct? 
Uh, what, what was running through your mind mm -hmm. as you were engaging and helping your father during this case? You know, it's kind of funny. Um, I would always go with my dad to crime scenes. Mm -hmm. um, when I was little, I used to sneak into the back of the car. When, you know, we'd be eating dinner. My dad would, like, work all day long, come home, try and have dinner with us, or try and come home and have something to eat, and then go back out to work. A lot of times, you know, when you have many employees, anyone that uh, has a business, I'm sure knows the, the pains of, of being a business owner. A lot of times, your employee who's supposed to, to be working at a specific place or specific location or specific ship gets sick or doesn't show up, you got to cover it. It mm. has to be done. And my dad, a lot of times, would, you know, be out there um, himself doing the surveillance work. Wow. So he would come home, eat hop in the car and take off and then be gone until, you know, two, three, four in the morning. Mm. Of course, I was a young boy and, and I always wanted to see what he was seeing. I wanted to do what he was doing, you know. I would only hear stories about it. So, you know, back in, in the late 70s, mm. um, all the cars were big. They were, they were big boats, right? My dad always had a big Cadillac. Um, so I would hide in the back of the Cadillac <laughs> on the floorboard, mm. right? And uh, he would take off. And uh, the funny thing is, in the beginning, I used to, as soon as he'd get out the gates and down the street and around the corner, I'd pop up and he'd be like, what are you doing? You're supposed to be in, <laughs> you're supposed to be in bed. So he'd make a U-turn, bring me back home. Oh, wow. um, and of course, he'd drop me off and go back out to work. As time went on, I, uh, I, I got smart enough to, to realize that I, I needed to wait until he got to the destination because then it was too far, too late for him to bring me back home. So that's what I would do. So many a time I, I, uh, I would go on surveillance with my dad. Of course, I was young, so I'd fall asleep. But I saw some crazy stuff while we were on surveillance, and that, that kind of just fed the bug that I had for that type of work. And, you know, when people are growing up, especially kids, you know, what they want to do changes week to week, day to day. They want to be a fireman. They want to be a policeman. They want to be an astronaut. Um, I always knew what I wanted to do. I always knew that I wanted to work doing the same thing uh, that my dad did. And I always knew I wanted to work with him. Mm. And, um, it, you know, when I, I went out on that case, mm -hmm. that, that big case, that first big case in, in, uh, in Greece, you were asking me what was going through my mind. My mind was don't mess up. Mm. That was my primary <laughs> focus because this was like my big chance, right? To prove to my dad mm. that I was ready and worthy to, to be, you know, working with him. So this was a case involving, um, are you familiar with Singer sewing machines? Yes. Uh huh. Okay. So Singer at the time was, is, is, it was a family owned business originally. And it was, it was the Singer family, S I N G E R. They were the largest sewing machine manufacturers in the world. And the, the case that we were working was for the heiress of the Singer fortune. She had a child with a gentleman that was a, uh, in the oil business. He, he did shipping of oil all over the world. And she was from Canada. And she went through a tumultuous uh, divorce with this gentleman. She was awarded child custody of their child, uh, Christian. And not Christian, excuse me, uh, Alex, Alex Nicolopoulos. And the gentleman was a Greek. He was of Greek descent. And um, even though she was awarded the child in the divorce, he took the child and fled somewhere in the world. No one knew where he was. So she hired us. And ironically, a pastor, I think, is the one that, that recommended uh, our services. And she came to us to track down her son. And after we tracked him down, to get him back. So he, when we found, my dad found him. He had, he had been gone for several weeks. He tracked him down to Athens, Greece. And after doing surveillance on him with, with our men over there for, for several weeks, he realized that this gentleman had his son completely protected 24-7. He lived in a, in a protected compound under armed guard. And uh, the only time that he was really vulnerable was when he went to a private school. And the private school had armed guards. Oh, wow. It was kind of an embassy school where the rich kids went, the politicians' kids went to learn English. Um, diplomats, children. So there was really 
know the way to get a hold of him and, and get in touch with him, wow. especially for an adult. So as my dad's trying to figure out the best way to go about penetrating or, or, or getting in touch with this, this boy, after he had located him, he hatched a plan to uh, put me in there as a student. Oh, wow. Um, so he calls me and tells me, look, this is what's going on. We know where this boy is. This is what I want you to do. I want you to fly here to Greece. And keep in mind, my dad's already over there with his men. He goes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you on a plane. I'm going to fly you over here. I'm going to have Hector R. Taylor make you a uniform that looks just like the uniforms of the kids that are going to this school. And I want you to go into the school because we know when, what time he comes in uh, to the school in the mornings. We know what time he leaves. We want you to get in there in the morning when, the, when all the kids are coming into to the school. And we want you to get a hold of Alex. And we, we want you to convince him to walk out the gates and around the corner. As soon as you walk out the gates and around the corner with him, we'll be waiting for you. So, I mean, I thought, you know, this is awesome. You know, this is this is finally my chance. You know what I'm saying? I've been going on, on surveillance. I've been telling my dad this is what I want to do all my life. So this is this is his big my big opportunity to show him that I can do it, right? So sure enough, he has um, he sends pictures of the uniforms to our our, ta our our office in El Paso. We give them to the tailor. The tailor duplicates the uh, the uniforms. Uh, he makes a uniform for me and. I get the uniform, they, my secretary, my our executive secretary, uh, my mom take me to the airport. They put me on a plane to, to Greece with one of our guys. And the entire time I'm studying a photo of Alex's face. This is all I have to go on. I have a picture of Alex's face, so I don't speak Greek, but fortunately he spoke perfect English. Mm. He was from Canada. Uh, and then he lived in England for a while, so he had a British accent. And um, I'm stu as we're flying, it was a, it was a long, long flight, um, but I, we, we did it in two legs. But by the time I get to Brazil, I had this kid's image wow. burned into my head, right? And I just keep thinking, I can't mess this up. I can't mess this up because if I do, it's going to be catastrophic for everything, yeah. including my yeah. own career and my dad, right? So we fly to Greece. My dad picks me up at the airport, mm -hmm. go back to his hotel, I get briefed. By, by him and the men. Mm -hmm. They showed me pictures of the compound. They showed me pictures of the school. They showed me pictures of the entrance. They showed me on a, on a, on a drawing where I have to go. Mm -hmm. uh, once I get out the door, where they'll be waiting for me. And like two days later, after prepping me, we drive up on that morning. And um, sure enough, we watch Alex get dropped off, walk through the gates, and I get out of the car. And of course, my, I'm all nervous, but I was focused. I knew exactly what I had to do. And before he got too deep into the, into the school, because my dad tells me, look, you can't go into the classrooms because I'll recognize you right away. That's, that's not being a student. He goes, you got to catch him before he goes into the school. And we had kind of a code word from his mother and grandmother so that he would know that it wasn't a trick. So... I think that um, they gave us the code word was what he called his grandmother is the nickname he had for his grandmother. Mm. And he had been told that his mother was dead, Oh wow! which was why he wasn't making too much of a fuss with his dad because he thought his mother was deceased. So I penetrate this, I walk through the, through the gates, walk right past the, the guards with a cluster of, of kids that were going in with their book bags and everything. So I'm walking around the compound, uh, the entrance of the school, and I spot Alex and I walk up to Alex and I tell him, look, my name is Jay. Mm. He goes, your grandmother sent me and my father to come get you. Wow. And he's like, my mother's dead. Who are you? I said, wow. look, your mother's not dead. Your mother and grandmother are waiting for you outside the gates. Wow. They're around the corner behind the building. I knew that that wasn't true, but I knew that was yeah. I was trying to improvise because I knew what it would take if I was him to get him out of that compound. And he's like, my, my mother's outside. I said, your mother's right outside. She's behind the building, but we have to go there and we have to do it right now. And we can't let the guards know that you're leaving. Otherwise, they'll prevent you from seeing your mother and grandmother. Mm -hmm. And at first he was really, really skeptical until I told him, you know, he started quizzing me. 
-hmm. And I said, look, your grandmother told me to tell you that this is what you call her. And as soon as I told him that, you could see the light bulb go off in his head and the, 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 his facial expression change. And um, he realized that, you know, I was telling him the truth. Mm -hmm. So Alex and I, you know, we kind of put our heads down and we walk out, you know, towards the, towards the exit of the, of the school. As we walk past the guards, the guard kind of ruffles my head. And I was like, I thought he was going to grab me. And I just kept walking. We walked out the gates, turned the corner, go around the corner. And my dad's waiting there in a black Mercedes with three of our guys. Mm. We hop in the car. And Alex is like, where's my mom? Where's my grandmother? So now he thinks he's being kidnapped, right? So he's starting to get nervous. But my dad and the guys take off. You know, we go several miles down the road. And um, we go into a predetermined location where they had another car waiting. We switch cars to a completely different kind and, and uh, color of car. And then we head towards the airport. And my dad says, look, because we didn't know if we were going to be successful. We didn't know if it was going to be that day or what hour we were going to be able to leave Greece. So the plan was to get to the airport as quickly as possible before all the authorities were alerted and to get on the very first plane out of the country, wherever it was going. Whatever the first plane out of the country was, that's the plane that we were gonna take. And then once we got to that location, we could catch a flight back to the United States. So that's what we did. We changed cars several times, got to the airport. By the time we got to the airport, I don't, you know, back then, I don't know if it's still that way now, there were armed soldiers at, at the Greek airport for security. Uh, there were military. And um, I remember that um, my dad told me and Alex to hide in the bathroom in one of the stalls and not to come out until he got us. And he says, I'm going to come out. When I come get you, we're going straight to the gate and it's going to be at the last second right before they close the door. So, you, you know, you got to go straight there. We can't stop for anything. Don't talk to anyone. Don't say anything. I've got your tickets. We had a, uh, we had a, a passport dummied up for Alex with a, with a different identity. So we had that ready to go. And Alex was supposed to be my brother. So we get on the plane, uh, you know, right, right at the last minute, my dad comes, gets us out of the stall. We run to the gate, get on the plane, take off. And um, we ended up going back to the United States. And we, originally we were going to take him to Canada, mm. but it turned out to be a huge deal. The, the military was looking for him. Mm. The police were looking for him. They were looking for us, but they had given a description of the kidnapper as a, uh, a six foot two man with a beard and a mustache, and it was me. Oh, wow. So we knew that they were just making stuff up, but they were still looking for Alex. So we uh, we decided not to go to Canada for his own safety. We took him back to El Paso, and we had him hidden out at our compound in, in El Paso, our North Loop, for for over a month. Alex was living with us for over a month. <coughs> Excuse me. His mother and grandmother flew in to to meet with him to see him after it was safe. And then eventually they took him back to Canada. Mm. So that was my first big international case. That that's you. That that in itself sounds like a movie. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll tell you this: uh, like uh, I, I think um, I, I've told several people that are guests uh, they need to do a book uh, or a movie. But I think for you, it would be more like you need to get a hold of uh, Pure Flix or Amazon Prime or Hulu or something. <laughs> And you, but you need to write a book about all this, and then turn it into a series. I actually, I actually am in the process of writing a book. Mm -hmm. You know, my dad had a best-selling book, mm -hmm. an autobiography called J.J. Arms Investigator, back in the late seventies, like 1978. And you know, over the years, you know, I'm not a big flashy, flamboyant kind of person. I kind of take after my mom. I've always been comfortable working behind the scenes. You know, supporting my dad, my dad's work. Um, you know, even though there was a lot of cases that I had a lot to do with the success of the, and the outcome of those cases. You know, my dad's always been the figurehead of our company and I never wanted to steal his, his limelight or his spotlight. Um, but over the years, you know, just casually, I would, you know, I've come back from out of the country and my friends would say, where were you, you know, for the past two weeks or three weeks. And I'd be, Oh, you know, we were working on a murder case or a kidnapping case in Mexico. And there'd be like, I tell them the details. Like I just told you about mm -hmm. the case in Greece. They're like, man, you got to write a book. Yeah. Like, no, that's, that's my dad's thing. And, you know, that's, that's, yeah. it's for my dad. But, um, as time went on, as, as the, the cool stories started to accumulate, 
And the more I thought about it, the more people kept telling me, you need to do this, you need to do this. I actually started working on it. Mm -hmm. um, so with the Lord's will, I'd say maybe next year, mm -hmm. um, I should have my my, auto, uh, my personal autobiography written. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully it'll we'll get it off the ground. And then after that, I hope to have, uh, you know, a second and third book, which actually will be true crime. Mm -hmm. It'll be telling real case stories on noteworthy cases that we've done that I worked on around the world and resolved with my dad. Mm -hmm. um, and it'll be, you know, telling those stories from beginning to end. Wonderful. Wonderful. So, now you bring up your mom. Uh, how was your mom in the middle of this whole thing? Uh, I, I, I know usually women are, are very moms are very protective of their kids. And, and it oh, yeah. is dads that will push the kids to, that daring moment to push them over the <laughs> edge to, you know, because you know what, if you don't get pushed, you're not going to get there. You have to get pushed. Right. There's got to be a balance as well where the mom needs to kind of, kind of keep the dad within bay without going too far. Uh, but what you just described, I can't believe of any mother saying, yeah, take my kid across the world in the middle of danger of him probably getting shot for trying to rescue some kid who got, you know, uh, a kid, how was your mom in the middle of this whole thing that she would allow you to go do this? I mean, uh, tell us you know, about your mom. It's kind of funny. My poor mom is, she's an angel. Mm -hmm. You know, she, she's an angel. Um, complete polar opposite of my dad. Mm -hmm. My dad's very flashy, very flamboyant. Um, my mom is very quiet, mm -hmm. very reserved. Um, she's, she's Chinese, 100% Chinese. My grandparents were from China. My mother was born and raised here in the United States. Um, but of course, any mother would be horrified for their child, especially 12 years old, yeah. going on a case like that. My dad um, always minimized what he was doing with my mom because, of course, he never told her how dangerous the case mm. was, or, you know, he, especially when he was going out to do it. Mm. He'd often tell her after he got back what he did, but he would never tell her ahead of time how dangerous it was going to be mm. especially when him and i would be going to do something because then she, <laughs> she would like to have a fit yeah she was always 100 percent against me going on surveillance with my dad and working with my dad she never wanted me to have anything to do with that type of work or that type of business mm. because of you know it was bad enough for her to have to worry about my dad and if my dad was coming home at night and then to have to worry about my dad and me not coming back from a case of course it was always very worrisome for her. Mm -hmm. So most of the time, you know, my dad would, and I would do something. First thing he'd tell me is like, don't tell your mother. Mm -hmm. Don't tell your mother what we just did. You go, you know, we don't advise but, uh, any father hearing us to do that, by the way, because moms will no. not like that at all. That's very bad advice. <laughs> but for your line of work, yeah, it yeah. worked. <laughs> yeah, I mean, your mom doesn't need to know about this. <laughs> you know, it's, it's between us. Yeah. But, you know, my mom was always very supportive. Um, you know, behind every great man, they say, is a great woman. And that's definitely the case with my mother. My mother um, supported my dad in every possible way. You know, you know, everything from, you know, being there to help him prepare mentally for the stuff that he did on a daily basis. Um, I mean, we, my dad, as a hobby, raised exotic animals. I mean, big exotic animals, tigers, lions, um, black panthers, cheetahs, jaguars. And um, that's, that's not something that's easy to do, number one. It's very labor intensive. Uh, it's very expensive to upkeep the animals. And they have to be fed every single day. There's no day off. Their cages have to be cleaned. They have to be watered. They have to be fed. So just like I was telling you about business owners who have to cover for their employees that don't show up to work. If our yard man didn't show up or the caretaker didn't show up to help, you know, feed the animals that day, my father and my mother would have to do it. And if my dad was out of town, my mother would have to do it. And that was no easy task to feed mm. all those animals. It was like a small zoo, literally, yeah. you know, but uh, my mom, my mom's tough, mm. you know, and, and, you know, despite her quiet demeanor, mm. 
you know, she she always got the job done. Now, you growing up, um, you, you mentioned a lot right now. We're talking about exotic animals, like you said, cheetahs and all that kind of stuff. So for you, was this just normal life growing up with this small zoo? Or, or would you be like, wow, this is crazy. I have a panther in my backyard or a lion in the cage, you know. How was you know, it for you? It, it, it's kind of funny, you know, mm. when you grow up with something, mm. good or bad, it's normal for you. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Until you see it happening with someone else and someone else's family, and it's it's contrary to what you're used to, then you realize, hey, something's not right about this, or this is different, or that's crazy, or that's cool. That's all I knew from the time I was a baby until the you know adulthood. I was raised around these animals; mm -hmm. that they were always present. You know, we always had all these crazy animals. We were always getting more. They always had to be taken care of. It was like a nonstop thing. And then of course my dad, um, my dad was, is a tough guy in, in so many different aspects and, and he wanted to raise me to be tough. So there was no coddling or, or, you know, being spoiled around my dad. Uh, I'm not to say, that's not to say I didn't live a really cool lifestyle and I wasn't very, very comfortable, especially more than, than a lot of my, my childhood friends. But I worked for everything. My dad made sure that that anything that I, I received that I worked for, you know. And so there was always chores to do. So feeding the animals, picking up after the animals, you know, taking care of the grounds. It was something that I was raised doing. So mm. until many years later, I didn't fully appreciate how crazy mm. that situation was about having all these, <laughs> you know, all these animals. You know what I'm saying? And it wasn't normal, you know what I'm saying, for anybody. Mm -hmm. But that's that's how I was raised. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I'm glad you're saying that because when when people hear of uh, kids uh, of maybe celebrities or or well off people, the first thing they think is you know they're just a bunch of entitled brats, and they don't understand that within a, a family that has that is very well off, there had to be a lot of sacrifice to get there it just didn't happen and not only to get there to stay there or even grow uh because if if i can recall uh the parents of your father were not uh wealthy people they were you know local no, grocers no. right and uh, you know they they were just common people in, in probably one of the uh probably the very not just we wouldn't even call it middle class it's it's, it's more of a low income area in, in, and actually, it's very close to to uh, uh, Indian uh, reservation here in, in Texas, and so it, it's not a well-to-do area. It's a very wonderful, beautiful area, but it's not the the mo It's not known for it being, you know, a, a wealthy area. And so he comes from no, very no, no. health, uh, very humble beginnings, and I guess he carried that that uh, concept of of valuing what you get and earning what you get with him, uh, with you all. Um, can you, again, the, a lot of people in the audience, there's some people that are probably tuning in because they know of your father. Uh, and, you know, there's so much to your dad uh, that I, I really suggest people really look into him a little bit more. But there's some people that just have no idea who your father is and they're just barely, their exposure to your dad is now coming directly from you. Uh, can you tell them, you know, what propelled your dad uh, to be so determined and, and go after life, though, despite what happened to him at the age of 12. Can you tell us, well, first of all, what happened to him and how that okay. led to him going after life like if he had everything on his side? You know, my dad, uh, when he was 12 years old, um, he had a friend that was 18 years old. And his name was Dick Caples, Richard Caples. And for people that are old school, you know, El Pasoans, if you go downtown, there's a building right downtown by the courthouse called the Caples Building. Well, that family owned that building. They were a very wealthy family. So Dick Caples was 18 years old. My dad was 12. He was significantly older than my dad. He was kind of the boy. He was he was the rich kid. He was one of the only kids in that in that area that that had a car, which at the time was extremely cool. You know what I'm saying? If you had a car and you were 18 years old, you know what I'm saying? You were, you were the man, 
So, of course, because of the age difference, my father's uh, mother, my grandmother, always told me, you know, stay away from that boy. That boy's going to get you in trouble. You know, he's he's from a completely different lifestyle than us. And, you know, he's too old for you to be hanging around. Of course, no one listens to their mother at 12 years old. And, you know, my dad hung out with Dick. One day, Dick comes over to my dad's house. And he has a box. So he calls my dad out and they go, you know, away from, from the home, the home where my dad lived. And um, he tells, he has my dad the box and he kind of steps back. So my dad asks, what's, what's in the box? He goes, I have, there's sparklers. And my dad's like, sparklers? He goes, yeah, he goes, they're, they're like fireworks. So my dad's 12 years old, you know, and he's, been given this box by someone he knows and is, is considers to be a friend. So my dad he goes, open the box. So my dad opens the box and he goes, my dad sees two, two devices in there. So he tells my dad, he goes, take them out, take them out of the box. So Richard is getting further and further away from my dad, but my dad doesn't think anything of it at the time. So he gets these two devices out of the box and Richard tells my father to pull a seal off. My dad pulls the seal off and he tells him, rub them together. My dad rubs them together and there was a huge explosion. Wow. That explosion knocks my dad about 15 feet from where he was standing. Wow. And my dad said that he landed right up against a tree. So, of course, you know, and if you've ever been around any loud fireworks, you hear the, 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 you know, the buzzing. Mm -hmm tone you know from from the blast my dad's a little dazed and he tries he said that he remembers trying to get up and trying to grab onto the tree to pull himself back up and he couldn't and he looks at his hands and his hands were shredded wow both his hands so that's one of the misconceptions that you'll see and read about on the internet that my dad has no arms no my dad has no hands is both hands have to be amputated at the wrist and um you know, when that explosion happened, Dick Capel started running. Mm. So if you can imagine, my dad's hands were mangled and there was blood squirting everywhere. So my dad's calling Dick, saying, Dick, come back, help me, help me. And Richard's running, and Dick's running back to his car. So my dad gets up and starts running after him with blood squirting everywhere. And he jumps in his car and my dad's like, let me in, you gotta take me to the hospital. And he's like, freaking out. He doesn't want to help. He's trying to take off. My dad's like, you've got to take me to the hospital. Blood squirting everywhere. So luckily, he, my dad gets in the car. He drops my dad off at the hospital, takes off, leaves my dad there. And ironically, the surgeon that operated on my dad, he was a family friend of my grandfather's. And my dad used to go to the clinic where that gentleman worked. And he used to watch, he, several times he watched him perform surgery. And um, he was my dad's, I guess the person that my dad looked up to. He wanted to be, my dad wanted to be a doctor as a young boy. That was what he aspired to do. He never intended to be a, a private investigator. And that gentleman was the one that ended up receiving my dad at the hospital and he was horrified. But um, he operated on my dad. My dad's hands were operated, uh, were amputated at the wrist. <clears throat> and then my dad um, was in, ended up being, you know, after he recovered, after his his uh, wounds were healed, my dad was fitted for prosthesis, um, and he had two steel hooks, and um, he was fitted for prosthesis and. One of the things that my dad, and this goes to his faith, because you had asked me about my dad's faith. My dad said that he remembers as a young boy laying in the hospital, and he said that next to his hospital bed was a window. And even though it was a bright El Paso day, he looked outside and he says he remembers all gray. Oh, wow. And he just remembered looking at his hands and looking out the window and looking at his hands that were no longer there. And asking himself and asking God, God, why did you do this to me? Why did you do this to me? And he says that 
he thought about it and all of a sudden something came into his head and says, you know, it wasn't God that did this to you. It was the devil that did this to you. God didn't take your hands. And he says that he asked God to forgive him for, for thinking that. And he says that he remembers looking out the window again and it was no longer gray, mm. but it was bright again. Wow. And, you know, to my dad's credit, he took that and he could have been an invalid. You know, a lot of you see people begging um, in wheelchairs and everything else without wheelchairs, completely healthy. My dad could have used that as a handicap for the rest of his life. He could have gotten benefits from the government. Um, he could use that as an excuse to never excel or do anything significant in his life, but he never saw that as a handicap. Everything that that changed my father in a very profound way. And I never I never really realized that at the time until many years later. Trying to, you know, my dad is just as much of a mystery to me a lot of times as he is to you and to many of your viewers because he's just a very different individual. And it's hard a lot of times to figure out why he thinks the way he does and why he does some of the things he does the way he does them. But a lot of times when you lose something, God gives you something else in return. And God, when my dad lost his hands, God gave him, in my opinion, so a sixth sense and, and a drive to succeed that very few people have. And my dad is a very driven person He uh, in everything that he does. He never does anything at the base level. Everything he does is always to the maximum of his potential or even it tries to exceed what he's capable of. The worst thing that you could ever do to, to my father is tell him that it can't be done or that it's impossible. Because then, because of his character, because of the way he's made up, it becomes something that he has to do to prove you wrong and prove to you that it can be done. And that's the, the, what's driven my dad all these years is to to be the most that he can be and accomplish everything that he can accomplish in life. And, and you know, what I've read up on, on him and, and in from testimonies of other people is like even the way he took you to Greece and all that, uh, a lot of people don't know that a lot of his work and why he was able to do that is because he pushed himself even academically without having to earn all these degrees. Uh, he learned several languages like Portuguese, Spanish, J uh, Japanese, I believe, uh, <coughs> Greece, uh, uh, Greek, excuse me, uh, Greek as well. You know, so he, <laughs> there's, there's nothing that would escape him, but he even became, uh, even with the situation of him losing his hands, I believe he's a black belt in, in karate as well. You know, so yeah. and there's nothing that I guess that he could just basically it was like a, a propelling of him to to achieve even more and the thing is, is it's not just that he achieved it is that he took everything that he achieved as tools to better serve those people that he was helping i mean it, it just it, they turned to into tools to help others and not just make it out of like right. look at what i what i accomplished uh, and i mean we're talking about him looking into uh, taking care of cases which are, I mean, there were high profile cases. Uh, we're talking about murders. We're talking about robberies. We're talking about missing persons, kidnapping, like you had mentioned. Uh, or I, I think out of all those, although they sound very like, wow, the most dangerous ones that I, I heard that he did uh, was dealing with uh, industrial espionage and sabotage. Because we all know that when it talks to, when it comes to money, uh, there's more than a target. Uh, there, there's several targets on your head already. Uh, was there any time that he was literally that there, there was an attempt on, on his life? No, there's been, uh, I believe, 16 or 17 attempts on wow. his life over the years. Wow. You know, my dad's been an investigator for a long, Correct. long time. You know, th this is a very unique and difficult business because unlike many businesses, virtually any other business, um, Everyone that comes to us comes to us because they have a problem, a life-changing problem. Either they've lost a loved one to, uh, to a murder, um, their loved one has been kidnapped, they've been defrauded, their life savings has been wiped out, wow. their son or daughter's missing. Um, and, and 
most of the time, they've already gone to the authorities. So you think about a police department, the FBI, state police, they have tremendous resources and tremendous manpower and tremendous training at their, at their disposal. They could call on other agencies to assist them if, if necessary. So they have already had the case, worked the case, and have not been able to solve the case by the time that many of our clients come to us for help. So our clients come to us, and now we are tasked with the job of solving a case that a large local, state, or federal agency couldn't solve with all their manpower and all their resources and all their training. So it's a tremendous amount of pressure, number one. Um, so you've got that to deal with. But the other crazy thing about our business is you make a lot of, in our business, there's, there's no middle ground as far as the people that we deal with. We deal with the client, which are the good guys, and we deal with the bad guys. When we solve a case for a client and the client is happy, the client becomes a lifelong friend. All their family, all their friends, everyone they know hears about us and what we did for them. They love us. But on that same case, on the opposite side of the fence, the person that we caught committing the murder yeah. or committing the theft or the fraud or the kidnapping, they hate us. Mm. They hate us. Their family hates us. All their friends hate us. Because instead of them being upset and realizing that, that person is now in prison for what they did, the crime they committed, they're in prison because of our fault. Mm. And you make a lot of powerful enemies, especially when you're dealing with cases yeah. involving killers, yeah. you know, and kidnappers and extortionists. You know what I'm saying? These people have all their friends are generally in the same business and have the same mindset and they have revenge on their mind. Mm. So you make some very powerful enemies along wow. the way as well. Yeah. So you make a lot of good friends and you make a lot of powerful enemies. Yeah. And unfortunately, some of the people that you deal with are of a level where they do something about it mm. and they're not happy unless they get their pound of flesh. Mm -hmm. So over the years, there have been you know, many attempts on my dad's life and on mine. Well, obviously, there's there's more than just being a shrewd or, or a, a very uh, effective investigator. There's obviously uh, a divine covering of protection over your dad's life. And I would like to go into that. But before before we go a little bit more in regards to his spiritual side, uh, I, I got to ask you this. I, I hope you forgive me uh, for this, but I got to ask you this. Uh, one of the most iconic uh, movies and novels uh, in our world is uh, The Godfather. And, of course, we have uh, the main actor, uh, you know, Martin, Brand uh, Martin Brandle's son. Who, who, well, not Martin Brandle's son, but Martin Brandle, who, who played The Godfather. Um, his son was actually um, kidnapped, and in, in I believe it, the, the whole thing went down in the year 1972. And uh, I mean, Martin Brando is one of the most influential actors, you know, of the 20th century. And, and of course, the movie is iconic. But in the real life, uh, his life, I mean, when it comes to our kids, it, it's our whole life. You know, his son was kidnapped. But in the middle of this whole thing, he came to your family for help. Um, can you just summarize a little bit? Just, just a quick recap. What was that all about? So back in the late 70s, or early 70s, I should say, Marlon Brando, who was long been and will probably always be one of the most influential and, and most known act character actors in the world, he took on a very controversial role as playing the godfather of the mafia family, a mafia family. Mm -hmm. And at the time, the mafia was a huge thing. You didn't talk mm -hmm. about the mafia. It's kind of like dealing with cartels today. Oh, yeah. And the head of a cartel and trying to play the head of a cartel. They don't like that. That's why you see so many journalists being murdered, people, reporters, uh, newspaper people, just talking about and reporting the truth, reporting a story that happened, reporting a, a bombing or, or just anything involving a cartel. And at the time, the mafia was very much like that. It was taboo. You didn't talk about the mafia, much less the head of the mafia family. And he 
decided to play a mafia don. He was the godfather. And right about that time, his son Christian, just as he had finished the movie and was about to be released, and during the time that he was filming that movie, he got he said that he got threats and was told not to play that role and that movie better not come out, but he did it anyway. And um, if you know anything about Marlon Brando, it's very much like my dad. He's very strong-willed and, and, you know, lived by his own, the beat of his own drum. And um, right as he finished that movie, his son, was, his son Christian was kidnapped. So the first thing that goes through his head is the mafia grabbed my son in retaliation for me doing this movie. So, you know, early on, my dad... You know, you always have to find a way to differentiate yourself from everyone else in, in your business, whether you're a plumber, an electrician, or a doctor, or an investigator. So one of the things that my dad did that was, even to this day, not done, was my dad was one of the only investigators in the world to guarantee results. He was the only one that says, if you hire me, I guarantee you that I will solve your case. So that was number one. That's one of the first things that made him stand out. And number two, he had already kind of developed a reputation among people that he knew in Hollywood as someone that was kind of like the go-to guy, whatever you need, you call this man, this man will get it done. Somehow, some way, when, when, when the Marlon Brando's son was kidnapped, someone in the industry told Marlon Brando, there's a guy in El Paso, Texas, by the name of J.J. Arms that you need to call. He will find your son, Christian. So Marlon Brando calls my dad, you know, biggest, biggest star in the world. Calls my father. It's kind of like a Johnny Depp, you know, calling you. And, um, or a Tom Cruise. He calls my dad, explains the situation. My dad takes on the case and um, gets all the details. And I think my dad says that after about a week of being on the case, he got a lead that there were because at the the there was he interviewed some neighbors and this is once again you know mm. it had already gone to the authorities the authorities were actively working on it but my dad goes and interviews the neighbors where in the neighborhood where Christian was abducted from one of the neighbors that hadn't been interviewed by the police said that they spotted an old Volkswagen van um, leaving the area at that time and they recognized that it didn't belong in that affluent area. So that's why they remembered that, that, and the people driving it looked kind of shady. Mm. So that was a clue. So my dad takes that lead and through investigative process ends up determining that a vehicle matching that description with people matching that description had crossed the border into Mexico down in, in Baja, Mexico, I think by Mexicali. And um, my dad, who was a pilot at the time, piloted uh, a helicopter down to uh, Mexico to start looking for that, that vehicle on the highway. Obviously, couldn't find it on the highway because it was they were ahead of him. And I guess he started flying along the coast. And actually, when he went to Mexico, he went to a town in, in, in Baja, Mexico. Because as he started working it more and more, he kept getting more information. Yeah, that vehicle, you know, got gas at this gas station. Yeah, we remember those people. Um, they weren't Mexicans. You know, they were foreigners. They were tourists. And he, he, one of them, I think, had told him there was a young boy in the vehicle with him. So the leads kept getting stronger. My dad went to the Mexican authorities, told him, look, I've got a tip that this, this van is parked right along the, the beach in Baja, Mexico, I need for you to come with me to help me see if this is the right van These and, and if Christian is in that vehicle. So you can make an arrest and I can recover Christian. They were like, okay, but how are we going to get there? You know, it'd take us two days to get down there. My dad's like, well, I've got a helicopter here. We can get, you can get in my helicopter and I'll fly you there. And they're like, and they look at my dad's hands or his hooks, I should say. And they're like, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> you know, we'll drive. So long story short, my dad ends up meeting the, 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 the authorities, you know, a couple days later after he spotted 
the, the van parked on a beach where there were some sea caves. And long story short, my dad and the Mexican uh, federales went, got to the camp. There were several tents out there. They raided the tents, pulled the people out of the tents. Mm -hmm. There were a bunch of hippies. And then they interrogated them, found out that Christian was hidden in one of the sea caves. Mm -hmm. And at the time, Christian had double pneumonia, I guess, from, from the moisture and, and being in the cave and, and then hiding him there. He had double pneumonia. He was on his deathbed pretty much. So my dad takes Christian. Um, the authorities make the arrest. They have these people held. My dad flies Christian back to the United States, gets him to the hospital, calls Marlon Brando. Marlon Brando says, Jay, I, I don't have any information to give you. Because I've told you everything I know. My dad's like, no, I'm not calling you asking for more information. I'm calling you to tell you I have Christian. And he was shocked. He dropped whatever he was doing, flew to the hospital, and, you know, met up with Christian. It was international headlines, and that was one of my dad's biggest cases, you know, um, that really, really put him on the map. Now, I, I, and again, I, I thank you so much for sharing that, 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 this all this stuff. Although your dad has has written uh, about this already, I hope you you give more insight from your perspective and you, and you write these books and and these series because it, it really needs to turn into a series. I, I really believe that. Uh, but throughout this whole thing, again, there has to be uh, a divine protection because someone that is doing this outside of law enforcement, even in, in law enforcement. I mean, I've learned that. Uh, even down to the people who are detention officers in jails, sometimes they get followed, you know, home by, you know, the people who are outside of the prison and stuff just to pressure them into, you know, uh, caving in or helping escapees and stuff like that. But uh, the, the world of crime is, is sometimes so dark that that's why a lot of good people just choose to stand back and let crime do what it's supposed to do. Right. God had to be with your dad, you know, in, in, in what he was doing. And there had to be, and there still has to be a divine protection here. Uh, in 1977, uh, your, your father uh, was interviewed by the Edmonton Journal uh, from Alberta, Canada. And he told them this, I've never failed on a case because my chief investigator is the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and with that, I want to transcend or, or transition a little bit. Uh, thinking about a verse that is actually from you know our our, our lectionary, our, our Bible reading that we follow, it is from Psalm one, uh, Psalm forty four verse one. This is from the NIV, and it says, "We have heard it from with our ears, O God. Our ancestors have told us what you did in their days, in days long ago." So, as you remember uh, everything, all these stories. What can you tell us about what you remember growing up or what you've seen growing up in regards to the faith of, of J.J. Arms, uh, his religious side? Because the Edmonton Journal also emphasized that your dad is, uh, is a very religious man. And as a matter of fact, at the age of 23, he had a come to Jesus moment where he was uh, like in the Hollywood scene, the parting scene. And that brought him back. I mean, and I don't know if that was a time that there was even like action figures of him, I believe, that were made of him. But can you just tell us a little bit about how he went from being having this dramatic, you know, uh, life of, of a tragedy of losing his hands, overcoming and being so resilient, overcoming and achieving a lot and then helping so many people. How, how did that come into play with his faith? And, and, and can you tell us a little bit about his faith in the Lord and his overcoming faith? Absolutely. Um, as I told you previously about that epiphany moment that my dad had when he had lost his hands and he was in the hospital, that's the earliest memory that I that my dad has shared with me about believing in God and asking God for forgiveness for blaming the loss of his hands on God initially until he realized that it wasn't the Lord that took his hands. But ever since then, you know, my dad has always been a big believer. And, and, you know, in hindsight, over the years, you know, you think back on your life, I think back on my dad's life and, and on our interactions and the things that he's taught me and the things that I've learned from him over the years. And, you know, I can honestly say, you know, I, 
my dad was not a very, um, he was generous in his own way. But like I said, he, he was very conscious not to spoil any of us. Um, especially, he was toughest on me. You know, I was the oldest of the children and I was his firstborn. I was a boy and I wanted to go into this business. And he made sure that, that I was tough. So I think back on, on the things and the gifts that I was given by my father. I, I can identify two key things that my dad gave me that, that were the most valuable things I've ever received from my father. The first thing was an example that he taught me uh, about his faith and to believe in God. He taught me to believe in God. And number two was a work ethic. He gave me his work ethic. To me, those are the two most valuable things that he could have given me as a father. My dad, you know, it's very easy when you're successful to be arrogant and to attribute your success because you're so smart or you're so good looking or you're so good at what you do. You know, my dad, despite all his success, has always made, made it a point whenever they ask him, why are you so successful? How did you solve this impossible case? How are you able to do what you do when no one else can solve these cases? One thing I've always respected about my dad was he always said, the Lord Jesus Christ is the one that opened my eyes, gave me the clues that I needed to follow and protected me on this case. He is the one that deserves the credit for solving this case, not me. Um, and you ask him, 30 years ago, or you ask him to this day, he'll tell you the same thing. Another thing uh, about his faith that, that always made an impression on me at a very young age. As I traveled more and more with my father around the world on, on different kinds of cases, you know, whether we were working on a case or he was being interviewed or we were traveling, my dad never really traveled for fun. My dad was a workaholic. We, we never went on vacation, except for, I think, as growing up, we went on kind of a family vacation one time. Um, and then I think as an adult, I took him on vacation, him and my mother, um, a couple times. I took him to, to, to Hawaii once and I took him to the Bahamas. And he was miserable because all he was thinking about was work. But anywhere that I, I went with my dad in the world, every night at the end of the day before he went to bed, and even when we were traveling, my dad would get on his knees by the side of his bed and pray every single night. I don't ever remember a night when he didn't do that, whether we were in El Paso or traveling on the other side of the world, in the Middle East, in Brazil, in Canada, in England, wherever we were at the end of the night, my dad would get on his knees and pray. And he, I believe he still does that to this day, even at his age. And that's a very powerful thing. And that, that's and another thing. Um, you'll never see my father have a meal without saying grace first. And it doesn't matter. A lot of people are embarrassed of their faith. A lot of people will do certain things behind closed door, uh, behind closed doors or at home when no one's looking or no one's listening or no one's watching. My dad will be out in public at a restaurant. Doesn't matter who we're with. It doesn't matter if we're with a client. Doesn't matter if we're with a dignitary. My dad will say grace before he has a meal. And a lot of people look at him kind of funny and like, wow, you know, I can't believe you just did that, you know? Or, you know, they, they kind of don't know, especially if they don't, they don't have faith themselves. They don't quite know how to, to take it or deal with it or, or address it. But that's kind of my dad's way of, of professing his faith publicly, you know? They see that my dad's a man of faith and they see that he believes in God and hopefully that makes a, a good impression or, or makes them think about their faith. Mm -hmm. Well, he's, so, he's, uh, he's part of what they call the, the greatest generation, you know, that we've had. Uh, and they're very resilient. I mean, uh, as a matter of fact, the, the tragedy that happened was back in the 1940s and just whatever you know, whatever you had to do to be able to overcome at that time, you know, quite honestly, Mr. Arms, anyone who would have an accident around that time, 
would not be here today because they did not have the medical technology that we have today or, Absolutely. you know, but I, again, there's, there's a, a there's a, a calling on his life that up to right now, I mean, he's, he's 90 years old, I believe, correct? Uh, he, he, goes on, he goes on strong and, and now and you can see the evidence in, in the family as well as they're strong and, and they keep on helping uh, those who are coming for them in need. And uh, I, I would like to ask you on behalf of uh, maybe your father, JJ Arms, and his life and legacy, what would you share uh, to anybody hearing this, you know, that in a nutshell, what would be the words of power and counsel uh, to those who hear in regards to getting inspiration from your father's life? What would be your words of power and counsel to them? You know, my father uh, is a living example that no matter what happens to you, no matter what tragedy befalls you, if you have a strong faith in, and a sincere faith in, in the Lord and his power, nothing can stop you and nothing can hold you back. The only thing that can hold you back is yourself. Um, you know, it's very easy to find excuses for not being able to do something, not being able to be successful in, in whatever it is that you do. Because it's very easy to just be lackadaisical and, and, and do what's easy. Um, or to blame your failures on a handicap or, you know, you're just not smart enough or, you know, but if you have a sincere belief in, in the Lord and what the Lord is capable of, as they say, I believe that all things are possible through Christ who strengthens me. And if you have that and you sincerely believe that there's nothing that you can't accomplish in this life. And that would be what my dad would partake with. Would, would give to, or the advice that my father would give to anyone who says, you know what, this is what I'm trying to do. This is what happened to me. I want to give up. I want to quit. Um, I don't know if I can go on. You know, the accident that my dad had when he was 12 years old, it really did end there. And that's not the only thing that's happened to my dad, you know, over the years. You know, there's many things that have happened to my dad, you know, gunshot wounds and, and illnesses and just all kinds of crazy things that that we can't explain except for divine intervention. There's been many, many cases that we worked on where we shouldn't have been successful and we shouldn't have come home. We, I mean, stuff that we've done in third world countries that we can never really talk about, we shouldn't have come home. And the only way to explain how we were able to be successful and survive some of the things that we did, it had to be God. It wasn't luck. It wasn't by happenstance. As a Christian, I believe, and my dad believes that it was because of God's intervention and his protection. I mean, we've been on planes that were on fire, that you know, that, I mean, you know, and, and, and we've been shot at, we've been, I, I, I just can't tell you all the stuff that, that we have seen and, and been through that it can only be explained by by God's divine intervention right. Right, that we survived. Mm -hmm. and you know what, what? And you know, if, if you're a non-believer, right. you can come up with a hundred reasons why that turned out the way it did. But as a believer, when your eyes are open, you know that's why. Correct. There's no doubt. And I, I think you know when when your dad was because I was reading the article from the that journal that I had mentioned earlier. Uh, one thing that they they kind of. Put, put it in there, but it's not, it's not very well taken seriously anymore. And because there's, there's something that they pointed out and it's that your dad tithed everything up. What a lot of people don't know what tithing is, is, um, is that you, you give 10% of your income to God's house. And the reason you do that is because it's God's house and you're God's child. And you provide for his house and God provides even way more for, you know, th there's no price tag on health. There's no price tag on your safety. There's no price tag on the longevity of your life. There's no price tag on fulfilling your destiny. And all he's asking is for 10%, but it's because you're connected to God's house and, and you're, you belong to the Lord. And it reminds me of one of the, the Psalms that I love to pray uh, almost at a daily basis. And it's from Psalm chapter three, verse eight. And this is from the Anglicized uh, NRSV version. It says, deliverance belongs to the Lord. 
So there's no other way that we can, you know, go with life and what we've gone through, or maybe even JJ Arms has gone through until we realize there's no way that we could have made it, but be being delivered from the Lord. Deliverance belongs to the Lord, but, and it goes on to say, may your blessing be upon your people. And uh, Mr. Arms, I would like to leave you with that blessing uh, for you, uh, for your father and, and your family life now, and, and for your business and for whatever it is that you're doing, because I know that you're doing it as unto the Lord. And I want to thank you so much for your time uh, with us. We, we value it and we honor your life and we thank you. We thank you for your patience. I, I do want to send a, a, a last shout out to uh, uh, Mary Helen Vias, you know, because uh, she's the one that was instrumental for us to be able to also be here with you. So thank you so much. Shout out to her and all the the Beller Highlanders that, that, that unite together, the <laughs> alumni. So, uh, but until next time, everybody else, thank you so much for joining us. Please leave some comments below if you have some memories or I uh, want to send good wishes to, uh, you know, Mr. Arms and his family. Um, go ahead and put your comments below and send us a good review. But until next time, we thank you. We ask you to join us so that we may supernaturally continue to walk on water. Be blessed. Thank you.